Biofeedback is a tool. In itself, it's not a therapy or a treatment modality, it's a tool. Biofeedback is founded on the neuroscience of the mind-body connection. It's based on measuring aspects of physiology that are part of the mind-body connection. In other words, it's about measuring physiological parameters that change with your subjective state of mind. They respond to the triggers for stress and emotions. What's happening in the stress response, or more generally in emotional responses, is that the brain is detecting certain threats or challenges, or just events of emotional significance. And then it's sending signals out into the body that trigger physiological changes. So muscles tighten up, your heart pounds, your breathing changes. You could say these changes embody the stress response, or they embody emotional responses. Other parts of the brain are listening out for changes in body state or for messages coming back to the brain from the body. This is the basis of feeling. Feelings, in turn, can trigger further responses in the brain, so creating a sort of feedback loop. At times, this can work against you by creating a negative spiral. So, for example, you have to deliver a presentation to the bosses at work and as you stand up, you feel your heart lurch. Feeling this, you think to yourself, you're going to look nervous in front of the bosses and they're going to think that you can't really cut it. And that triggers a further body response. So maybe you start to blush and so on. What we're doing with biofeedback is we're attempting to constructively influence this loop in order to break the negative spiral and take things in a more favorable direction. So in biofeedback, we're measuring physiological correlates or particular aspects of physiology that respond to stress and emotional triggers. Muscle tension is an example. We tend to tighten up under stress. And if we can measure this tightening, then we have a viable biofeedback parameter. Well, we can indeed measure muscle tension via an electrical parameter called EMG. The next step is you feed back your measurement in real time, which just means that we show you the parameter as a graph on the computer screen as we measure it so that you see the graph change as your body changes. Feedback is key to learning. When you're trying to achieve a certain outcome, feedback tells you whether you're succeeding or not. It tells you whether you're getting closer to your goal or further away. It tells you whether you should do more of the same or whether you should stop and try something different. You need feedback, whatever it is you're learning, at least anything that involves the body. And usually feedback is a natural part of the activity. So if you're learning to play tennis, when your shot goes into the net, that's feedback. Or if you mistime your shot and it doesn't feel right, that's also feedback. If you're learning to play a new tune on a musical instrument, you know when you've played a wrong note because it sounds wrong. So that's feedback. So feedback tells you the difference between what you wanted and what you actually got. And for feedback to work, your senses need to be able to perceive the difference. In biofeedback, you're getting explicit feedback about something that you could easily miss. Again, muscle tension is a helpful example because tightening up can be very subtle. For example, in response to a subtle stressor and you might not notice it. So biofeedback is really just accentuating what is a subtle internal feedback. And in so doing, it helps you to become more sensitive to your body's internal feedback. In this way, it enables learning. But it's worth saying that you won't always need biofeedback. At some stage, you can grow beyond it. So it works a bit like stabilizer wheels on a child's bike. So I've said that biofeedback is a tool for learning. But there's more that we can say about how biofeedback creates change. Firstly, biofeedback creates a context for gaining insight into the mind-body connection, how emotions work, how stress affects us. The understanding that follows then frames what we can do. It comes down to understanding what works and what doesn't work, or what can work and what will never work. A lot of the time, the real problem is not quite what you think it is, but it's your effort to achieve something that's not ultimately possible. And this simply perpetuates the problem or makes it worse. And this is often the case with anxiety and stress. A common coping strategy is to prevent anxiety from arising by avoiding the potential triggers. This is never really going to work. Anxiety is a natural human emotion. It's not a disease. A better strategy is to learn to quickly recover when you do encounter triggers. 
Secondly, biofeedback offers a context for skills development or skills training. This is really what I was talking about in the last slide. When you engage in a challenging activity that provides feedback, then learning will happen quite naturally and spontaneously. That's what brains do, they learn. Thirdly, biofeedback can be a kind of fitness training for the brain or for the nervous system. This is a little different from learning. Suppose you regularly go to the gym and lift weights. The result is that over time, your muscles are stimulated to strengthen. Let's say the day comes when you need to move some furniture at home. Because you've exercised, you can respond to the challenge quite easily. If you hadn't trained, the muscles wouldn't be prepared and things would be a lot more difficult. Well, biofeedback is like weight training for the brain and nervous system. If you exercise regularly, then when life's challenges come along, as they inevitably will, you're much better placed to respond effectively. That doesn't mean that the stress response won't happen, but your body will naturally keep it within bounds and you'll be able to recover quickly.